tonight is Tani Tester. And I have a few things before we continue where we left off last week. Just a few insights of uh, what's going on now. That's the preparation for tomorrow and the preparation for Purim. As we know, the, there's a wording of a, it's a breast liver minhag, if you want to call it, to say already 30 days before Purim, Hashem saved me from the klipa, the evil force of Haman Amalek, and sanctify me in the holiness of Mordechai and Esther, right? This wording as it is, it comes from Rav Nossin, in Rav Nossin's prayer in the Kutei Tfilot, part 2, 37, which is this beautiful prayer that he wrote for Purim. So there, it's here, right? So here it says, he, this wording appears here in the, in the second last, uh, twice it appears. But mainly here, to be saved fr from the clip of Haman Amalek, and also to be sanctified in the holiness of Mordechai Nestor. So the question is, <laughs> I need the holiness of Mordechai and Esther in order to break Kripat Amana Amalek. The wording should have been Zakeni the Kedushat Mordechai Esther, and then Hatzileni the Kripat Amalek. I need what I, I can't fight Amalek. I need this help of the light of Mordechai and Esther to fight the the Kripat of Haman Amalek. So why did, why is the the order reversed? We say first save me first from this evil force of Haman, and then sanctify me. So the here is something very, very important, something very powerful. Rabbi Nachman brings down a few times in his uh, conversations in uh, Chaim Moharan and also Rabbi Nachman's wisdom. He says there a few times that he can only help somebody, that Sadi can only help somebody who comes to him. And he also said and elsewhere that a Sadi can't do all the work. In other words, you can't just come close to a Tzadik and throw everything on him and sit back and relax and do, uh, okay, I'm taking vacation. The tzaddik says, you, you have to do also, you have to give your part. And your part mainly is the initiative, you do the first move. So, back to this now. Crying out, Hatsileni miklipat haman amalek, Hashem save me from this evil force, is coming from somebody whose heart is totally broken and feels the pain and the severity of the danger of haman amalek in his life. Such a person, then the tzaddik can come into the picture. Then comes in and sanctify me the light of Mordechai and Esther. The light of, to explain, the light of Mordechai and Esther corresponds to the light of the tzaddik. That's the light of the, the tzaddik. It's two parts of the tzaddik. Mordechai is the upper part and Esther is the lower part. Together they form what Moshe Rabbeinu was in his generation. Mordechai and Esther is for us and for the future redemption. For Mashiach Bezat Hashem. It's a combination of both. To activate this, I need first to be able to cry out to Hashem. The tzaddik is someone who has futility, futility thoughts, thoughts of depression and thoughts of yush, the tzaddik can't help. In other words, the fact that you're still alive when they pinch you, for such a person, the tzaddik can help. But a person who gets pinched, I don't care anymore, I'm so dead and everything, the tzaddik can't help such a person. Only a person who khpatlo, something still bothers him, there's still some trace of life, that when you pinch him, it hurts and he cries out and he makes a move, I don't want this Hashem. I don't want to be dead. I don't want to be in the hands of Amalek. I want to be alive. Such a person, the tzaddik can help. So that's why the initiative is without the help of the tzaddik that you're crying out. You're not saved from Haman Amalek, but you're crying out, save me from the clip of Haman Amalek, that you're crying out about it. So that's enough ready to activate the Seifa, the end of the Bakasha, which is, let me be zochet, the light of Mordechai and Esther, which then can come in and yes, save me from an Haman Amalek. But first, I must make the first move. I have to do the first part of crying out, That's one thing I wanted to mention. That in, in breast lifts, you have to do, there's a lot that the Tzaddik does, almost everything, if you want to say. There's a lot involved. In the, the, the light of the tzaddik, the merit of the tzaddik, they speak a lot about the tzaddik, the tzaddik, the tzaddik, yes. But there's one part that's you. And that's what? The first move. The initiative. You have to make the first move that what? That you're bothered. That, you can't, that you're not happy with what's called status quo. You're not happy with how things are. It's bothering you. You want to come closer to Hashem. You want to come out of the, of the constriction. You want things to happen in life. It bothers you. Ah, that's up to you. That's your free will. Then the tzaddik can help. Like again, Rabbi Nachman said, I can only help, help a person who comes to me and tells me what he needs. That means you make the first initiative. It's not okay, breast of, give me everything you need. It's like when, 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 when Rabbi Yudul came to Rabbeinu the first time. So Rabbeinu said to Rabbi Yudul, 
who was like a, already a Kabbalist, he was a tzaddik and everything. So he came to Rabbeinu and he said like this, Yoreinu Rabbeinu Derech Lavodat Hashem. Please let our master, Rabbi Nachman, show us a pathway in the service of Hashem. As if like, next time he's coming, you know, give it, you know, I'm here, give it to me. So Rabbeinu immediately slapped him. He said, not, not physically, he gave him, he said something which is a slap. He said, Ladat Ba'aretz Darkecha, you want to know Hashem in your earthliness, your lowliness? And he heard that, it, it shook him. Because Rabbeinu wanted emesdik, he wanted people to be amiti. When you come to the tzaddik, amiti means that you're living your reality. What's your reality? That you're, you're humbled, you're cut, you're, you're, you're not able to function normally. That's no, unfortunately, that's normal in the Galut. We, have, we need the tzaddikim to get out of that. That's the only way that tzaddikim can help is if you're emesdik, if you're amiti, which means that you're, you're open to the reality of the situation that it's difficult, that you're not davening like you should be, your kedusha tainaim is not like it should be, your learning Torah is not like it should be, and you admit it's not like that, and that's why you're coming to the tzaddik for help. That's what's needed, that you, you recognize the situation, the reality, and you're crying out to Hashem for help and assistance. If you looked at most people who've come to the teachings of Rabbi Nachman or come to Breslev, 98% of them, or you can say 100% of those who came, is because there was something, there was an unsatisfaction feeling in life. There was a feeling that some, there's a big gap, something is missing. Why else do you come to Breslev? Why would you stick your neck out to come to Breslev? Stay in your Hasidic Shevelt, stay, stay home. What are you coming to Breslev for? You're coming, or someone who's in another world, another world, uh, Balchua, for example. Stay in your world, what are you looking for? What are you sticking your neck out? Because something is bothering me, it hurts me. I'm not, I'm not satisfied because I feel something is wrong here in life and it has to be fixed. So this is the first move. And this is why first, and then that already leads the way for eradicating Amalek through the light of Mordechai and Esther. But you have to start with crying out, at least requesting. That's up to you. That's not the tzaddik this night, that's you crying out to be saved. Then the light of the tzaddikim of Mordechai and Esther come to help. But it starts with you making the first move. The free will is up to you. That's one point. Now, tonight, tomorrow is called Ta'anit Esther. If you look in the Halakha, this day, what was, the, what was this day? What was the 13th of Adar? This is the day that the Jews fought against their enemies. It was a day of war, and yet we call it the fast of Esther. What does it have to do with Esther? It's a, it, should, it should be called Ta'anit Purim, or Ta'anit Nitzachon Shushan, or something. Give it a nice name. We call it Ta'anit Esther. What's going on? If, if you look in the story of Megillat Esther, the Ta'anit of Esther didn't take place on the 13th of Adar. When it says in the Torah, when it says in the Megillat Esther, she said to Mordechai, V'tsumu alai shloshet yamin, fast for me three days. That's what Esther said. And that we call Ta'anit Esther. The fast on Esther was on Erev Pesach, Pesach, and the second day of Pesach. Right? That, if you look in the story of Poem, that's what had happened. And then we call this fast tomorrow, which is in Adar, we call it Ta'anit Esther. What's going on here? So the idea here is what leads to activate the light of Purim is Dafka this fast. In Halakha, this fast is the most lenient fast. You have Heterim, according to Halakha, even Pshat Halakha, someone has a headache, has eye pains, whatever. It's the most lenient fast. However, on the other side, what you gain from this fast is unbelievable also. It's Chaval. Chaval to lose the fast because of some leniencies and some uh, discomfort and then just to go ahead and eat. It's such a powerful fast. To explain, all these past weeks we've been talking about less than 62 in the Kutimran and this Torah now, 163. Where it comes out in this Torah that fasting, the idea of fasting, which now will be Lema'aseh tomorrow. Lema'aseh tomorrow is a fast which is the Rabbanan. It's an obligation to fast according to Allah, right? What the fast does is it stops Pharaoh's three henchmen, we said. The Sar Haofim, Sar Mashkim, Sar Tabachim, the three tubes in the, in the, in the throat, the, the jugular vein, the esophagus and the trachea, which is the Kane Veshet Veridin, which the Arizal says correspond to the three henchmen, the three officials of Paro, right? Paro is the Haorif, the back of the letters is Haorif, which is the nape, the back of the neck. Mitzrayim is the tightness of the throat. And the three ministers, the three, Shalosh Sarim, are these three tubes which are dependent on food. The food intake is how the klipa, paro, the evil sign, have a, have a clutch on a person. How you eat, your level of emunah and eating, the holiness and everything, that will determine how much paro has a hold on you. And what's the nafkamina? So what comes out is that you can't talk to Hashem afterwards. They control your speech. Because in the throat area, you have the faculty of speech. Ah, 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 we talk. And also eating. Hashem made it that in the throat area is eating and also speech. 
Why? To show the connection. There's a connection there. That through the eating, that's how the speech is. So the fasting, Rabbeinu teaches in this lesson 62, when a person can't dive in, he feels that his words are trapped in his throat. He feels he can't express himself. A way to stop and to break this and to start again to be able to dive in is through the idea of fasting. Mamash ta'anit, which you have a schut tomorrow to do. What we gain from the fast is that Paro, Mitzrayim, the three sarim of Paro, they have no clutch on the food because in the food contains holy sparks. And they are, they're after the holy sparks in the food. So by not giving them that on the fast day, so they have no stronghold. And then the, what's called the, the, the waters of Chesed. This is a Kabbalistic term, Avram Avinu, which is called Meme Chasadim. It's a lesson 62. Comes down to, comes down to water to moisten the throat so you can call back to Hashem. The verse says, Kra begaron al tachsoch. Call out in your throat and don't tachsoch. Don't try to minimize. Talk to Hashem open. And this is through the idea of fasting. And this is what Esther said, Sumu alai shloshet yamim. She told Mordechai, I told the Jews to fast for me three days. So to subdue the three sarim of Paro. To subdue the sar ofim, the baker, sar mashkim, the, the wine steward, and the sar tabachim, the slaughterer in order that they should have no grasp on the holy sparks of the speech, which are dependent on the sparks of the food. So this is the advance, advantage of the fast. And through this, we can come to the miracle of Purim. What is the main miracle of Purim? Is that davening works. The whole story of Purim is to show every year, every year, that prayer works. Even in the most desperate, the most dead end, the most I give up situation, which was Purim. Purim was a dead end situation. It was Khatum, it was sealed in heaven and down on earth that the Jews have to be killed. Even in Shemaim, that's why Mordechai was shaking. He was shaking, and it's the Midrash says on the words, Esther, when Mordechai sent her the message, what message did he send her? The Midrash says, she knew that there was a decree. She found out, everyone knew. It, was, it says in the Megillah that Haman and Achashverosh, they signed, and it was given on that day in Shushan. She also knew about it. But they thought, okay, it's a decree, it's a joke. Just like the first decree was a joke, when, when Ahasuerus sent out that every man should, should rule in his home. People at the Midrash says they took it as a joke. So to this one also, they said it's another joke. But when Mordechai showed Esther what Eliyahu Navi brought him, the star from heaven, with Khatum, with a, with a seal but made of teat, that Hashem agrees to destroy the Jews. So it says, Vatit Chalchal, she shaked. She had, she had Nida, it says in the Midrash. She, she, she was so shaking, she had her menstruation, and Mordechai also was shaking. It was severe. It was mamash, like the, the wording in Chazal, et tzara asher kamo lo niata. It was a danger that never existed, and yet, devenafochu. And this message of Purim is the idea that prayer works, davening works. Hashem listens to your, your prayers. Dafka, when you're in a dead end situation. Dafka, when you feel finished, wasted, Gar everything's done, I'm gurnished. Dafka then, this is the whole idea of, 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 of Purim, to teach that miracles happen even for the worst situation, even for the scenario that you don't, I can't imagine how Hashem is gonna save me from this situation. I have no idea I'm gonna, I'm gonna, how I'm gonna make it. I have no idea, there's no rational way how I'm gonna make this miracle happen, this miracle that I need desperately, a dead end situation, someone's deathly ill. There's a fatal situation, there's a money issue, there's a Yerush issue, whatever. That person's going through major, major, major tsarot that he, can, that he can't handle anymore. And he feels, that's it, I'm finished. It's not working, it's not advancing. Purim comes to teach that prayer works. But in order for Purim to happen, you have to first have Tani Tester. You have to subdue Mitzrayim. Subdue the idea of the clip of Mitzrayim, the idea of the food, which is why we fast. The fast is according to how much you mashkia, you invest in Tanit Esther, which is the za'akot, the tefillot, the prayers tomorrow, the slichot, and you keep the fast, believe it or not, that has a major part in how your poem will be. Your poem, the simcha, and the joy, and the tefillah and poem is dependent on how the Tanit Esther is. So we call it, even though it was the day of war, that's the day that the Jews went out to fight all the enemies, we call it Tanit Esther for generations in order to, know, to, 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 to remind us our main victory over the battle against all our enemies is Tshuva, Tanit, Davening. Those three things, repentance, prayer, Tzedakah also, but, but these inyanim, these ideas of, of fasting and prayer, 
tshuva, this is our weapon against all our enemies. Not, it's not now but that... So because of her, because it activates Esther. That Esther is the one who uh, is the Dibor. Sorry, I didn't explain. You're right. I assume that we know the classes before. We said in the past classes that Esther is like Sarah. 127 Medinot, 127 years. The Mitra says this connection between Sarah and Esther. And what was Sarah? Sarah, Rabbeinu teaches, is the union of holy speech. Because Sarah means Serara, which means rulership. And in Melech Beloam, the rulership is through speech. When a ruler rules, he's not deaf and mute and he writes what, he, what his proclamation is. He talks that the king, he gives over, I want this to be done. He tells with his mouth, I want this, I want taxes like this and this and that. That's how a ruler gives over what he wants done is through speech. So that's Sarah. And that the Midrash connects Esther to Sarah, shows the connection. And the whole koach of Esther was through speech. Her whole victory was that she spoke to Achashverosh. And she spoke to Hashem. Keli, Keli, Lama Zavtani, Hashem, why did you leave me? We're the davening to Hashem. The whole weapon of Esther is the inyan of speech. So when she said, when she said, that sumu alai, fast for me, it's in order to release her, to bring her out, the koach of Esther. When it says, Valtidbash Esther, right? Esther, she dressed up, and then she went into Achashverosh, she, even though she wasn't called in. So the Rashi brings down, she was dressed with what's called Malchut, Ruach HaKodesh. This is the... Esther being enclosed with the power of speech at the maximum. And that's what we try to do on, poor, on, on Tanit Esther. To activate, it's the Tanit for the sake of activating holy speech, which is called Esther, which is the idea of Sarah. Sarah, Sarara, Esther, 127, they're all one concept. And by speech being released because of the fast, then we can really dive in. And that's the idea of poem also, the speaking of the Megillat Esther. But we know already the idea of the davening of Purim, the, the breast of tradition, the, 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 the prayers on, on Purim are the most powerful prayers of the year. And we said last week also, what, it's, what the Magid the Mizraj explains on the Halacha, Kola Poshet Yad, no, you know, anyone who sticks out their hand on Purim, Halacha is, you have to give it to no questions. You know the guy has a Rolls Royce, you know he's rich, he goes like this on Purim, you give, no questions asked. And the Magid says this also applies between man and Hashem. Whoever sticks out their hand to Hashem, Hashem has to give. That's the rule on Purim. So this power of prayer, a lot, and it's how much force you put in to ask Hashem. Hashem can give you five dollars, He can give you five million dollars on a spiritual level. It depends on how well you ask, <laughs> how much you put into it. So Tanit Esther gives us through this, the fasting, which, uh, which lessens the grip of Paro and Mitzrayim, that the, the, the speech is stuck, it comes out now. The speech comes out due to the Tanit, so that it comes out full force on Purim, and I can activate what I need, visit Hashem, the Kola Poshet Yad, that my davening can come out, and that Hashem will fulfill it much more greater than if I were to daven just a quiet davening like this, a quiet request. A stronger request gets much more from Hashem, even on Purim. Fine. So with that, we're going to continue now. Where we left off, we're in the Kutimoran. There's copies of the here, right? Under here, yeah, the Kutimoran here. Lesson 163, Kuf Samech Gimel. We started this lesson. We're going to see what we just spoke about now, how it's in these. We're going to continue. Vine. Kesha Dibur, who Dibur Kadosh. So now, when speech, he said beforehand, there's many types of Dibur. Yeah, and, and each one is called Sarah. But there's levels of Sarah. There's Sarah, there's one, there's one who's called Sora Bebeto, like we saw in the Megillah. So each person is Sora, it rules in his home. Then you have Sarah Lumati, a person who's like a governor, a mayor over a nation, a, like a country, or a, a region, or a city, and you have Sarah uh, al Sarah al like Sarah was called. So you have many levels of the speech which is called Sarah, like we explained, because that's the rulership. So now, but Sarah herself, Sarah Imenu, she was the climax of speech. So he says, V'hine, kesha dibu dibu kadosh speech, when it's in the category of holy speech, bechinot Sarah, which is the idea of Sarah Imenu, our, our matriarch, Sarah, who was fully the idea of Holy Sarah, Shaya Shechina Ima, that the Divine Presence was with her. Af Shaya Tsar da Avraham me'od me'od be'et shenit kecha, even though it was very difficult, very, very difficult for Avraham when she was taken by Paro, in the house of Paro, right? Im koze yada u'batach b'ashem sh'uto v'agdona shenit pesad Hashem. Nevertheless, he knew and he believed in Hashem. That this will be a tremendous benefit, 
that some tremendous good will come out of this, that she was trapped there. How could it be? That from this, that from Sarah being taken in captive in the, in the house of power, such a tameh, such an impure person, right? That from this will come tremendous pleasure to Hashem Barach. Why? He's, he's explaining slowly, he's developing the lesson. This is a pasuk from Kohelet. There's a time when one person, one man, rules over another man, and it's not for his benefit, it's for his, the opposite of his benefit. It's for his, 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 uh, his uh, what's it called? His, this, I, forgot to say, I forgot to say the word in English. <laughs> God is the opposite, opposite of benefit, for his... <laughs> Dissatisfaction. No, there's another word for his, uh, his, loss. his loss. There's a better word though. I, I forgot in English. My, my English is not here. It's detriment. That's the word. I looked in English here. Detriment. Right. So it's for his detriment. It's for his loss. One guy is stronger than the other one, but it's temporary and the person's going to lose because of that. So how was that in the case of Sarah? She, she says, this is from the Zohar. This is from the Arizal. Sorry. Sheliketa misham nitzotzot akdoshim kayadua. That she, Sarah, was sent the house of Paro in order to collect holy sparks from there as is known. This is an amazing concept where the evil gets permission to purposely swallow up holiness and this is done so that the holiness can extract from the impurity holy sparks. This is a big explanation of what Am Yisrael is going through today on a, on a national level. We have so many Yidin who are not religious, who are totally detached and they're sent to places so far, and if and when these Jews wake up and come back, what they do by doing that is they bring back with them the holy sparks that were trapped in these low places far, and bring it back with them. That was the whole purpose of it happening in the first place. The Jews are thrown and scattered all over the world, and also in such ugly and low situations, in order that when they wake up and they come back, so they pull out all these holy sparks. It's like a miniature version of Sarah coming out afterwards from Paro and from Egypt and Avram leaving with all the wealth coming up. We're going to see that all the wealth that Avram Avinu left with is the, is, the, is the idea of holy sparks. When it says that Paro gave gifts to Avraham because of Sarah, that he gave him gold and silver and clothing and malin, camels and donkeys and all the lists that the Torah goes through, inside these items of gifts, were holy sparks that were trapped in Egypt, there kept all along. And Avram and Sarah had to descend there in order to reconnect to these holy sparks and pull them up. This happens on a national level and also on a personal level. Every Jew goes through this. When you're sent in a low situation where you're totally out of it and you feel far from Hashem, and even a person sometimes falls into doing bad things, if after this he doesn't give up, he holds on, and then he comes back to Hashem, and he's coming back from these low situations, so he's pulling with him all these sparks that were there. That's why he was sent there in the first place. This is the idea of Yerida Letzorch Aliyah. This is the whole idea here. That it's a down for the sake of the, of the up. That you're sent down, not, it's like, it's not like Hashem is pushing away, I don't want you, and I, I, when, you, when you're down, do you feel? Hashem doesn't need me, my da'i doesn't need my davening, it's all just a waste of time and this and that. When a person has these thoughts, that's the Yetzirah, obviously. The main thing why a person was thrown down is to collect holy sparks. When he's going to get up, he doesn't know. But he has to wait and keep on yearning until the time comes where they pull him out. When you see this idea, it says that it's a tzaddik amiti comes and pulls out a person who's, who's a regular guy and doesn't have the koach on his own to get out. So it's a tzaddik who helped to pull him out of the situation. But this idea repeats itself again and again in history on a national level, on a personal level. And the, the story with Sarah was the, class, the top example, that Sarah was a tzaddika. And Pharaoh didn't touch her, she didn't fall. And, and her coming out pulled out major holy sparks from Paro that were trapped there until then. And, but this idea comes up again and again and again. But the idea that Rabbeinu brought the example of Sarah is that he says elsewhere, Rabbeinu, in Lesson 8, Part 2, that the average Jew on his own can't get out. You can't get out. When the person was very low, gets trapped by evil, on his own he can't get out. He has to wait, it's just coming up here also in this lesson, for a big tzaddik to come in his domain to pull him out. So this idea that Sarah, who is the idea of the tzaddik, Sarah is a tzaddik, huh, is purposely sent, he, he allows himself, it's, it's the, the verse Rabbi Yehud brings in Torah Chet Tinyana, is Chayil Bala, Chayil Keenu, Mibitno Yerushinu El. 
Chayid Bala, the evil, swallows up Chayid. It's like a soldier, soldier, a strong, powerful force, but Yetzirah doesn't realize it. He thinks it's just another, another drop of holiness to swallow up. So the evil, unknowingly, the tzaddik hides himself, covers himself up, so that the evil doesn't know that this is a powerful tzaddik, and he allows himself to be swallowed up by the evil, but then when the evil tries to swallow, as if to say, Kivyachal, there's like a, a throat to the evil, Chaim Bala, he tries to swallow, but he can't, he, he vomits out, he spits out, because the tzaddik, Rabbi Yenu says there, he stands in the throat of the evil side, as again, it's all, it's all an analogy, you can, it's not physical throat, it's the idea that the evil side is swallow the holiness, but the tzaddik stands in the throat of the evil, and when something gets stuck in the throat, what happens? The person vomits, begins to, he gets to regurgitate and things come out. So this is what the idea of Sarah is also, that she was sent to the domain of Paro to help those sparks trap there to get them out. Only Sarah can do it, only a big tzaddik or tzaddika like Sarah can go into the, the area of evil and now to cause a lot of balagan, a lot of damage there, that the evil now can't do what it's supposed to do, and it gets stuck in the throat. The holiness of Sarah gets stuck. That's what happened. We see Rashi says that she was telling the Malach, hit, and the Malach was waiting just to smash Paro. And by Naga Hashem it made Paro, all the house of Paro was inflicted. Al pi Sarah, it says the verse there, through the mouth, through the speech of Sarah, the Zafka Dibur is the force of the Tzaddikim to do all this powerful act of, of, of releasing holy sparks. So this applies also a tzaddik towards us, the idea. First of all, personal, personally, when you're thrown in a low situation, you have to hold on and wait for the up to come. But also, between you and the tzaddik, you are considered like holy sparks trapped due because of what you've done in your life in the past. And a tzaddik comes along and comes to release you. He comes to your area and opens up and allows you to escape. That's the idea of Sarah. Okay? So we'll explain these things better now, slowly. But this is the idea of et, asher shalat ha'adam be'adam. It's a time when one person, in this case, paro, shalat ba'adam rules over another person, Sarah. Leralo, for the bad, for the detriment of paro, in order to extract all the holy sparks, all the wealth that was trapped, the spiritual wealth that was trapped by paro, comes out when Sarah comes out. This is a concept which is very common and very necessary in Yiddishkeit. It's very necessary and happens again and again on a daily basis. All your ups and downs is basically this, that you're in a down, why you're in the down? It's not because you're evil and you're getting punished and uh, you did terrible things and everything. You have a mission to do. Your mission is to wait here for the door to open and then when you come out, you pull up with you all these sparks that only you can pull out. No one else can do it, only you. Only you, no one else can do it. It's only you who can get to this situation to grab what has to grab. It's like Rabbeinu brings an example. I'm sorry, Rav Nassim, the Kutel He brings an analogy of the scuba divers back then, 100 years ago. How were the scuba divers 100 years ago? They went under the water to search for pearls under the sea, right? And they had, the, like, not like today, where the oxygen tanks. They had like a little tube connected to the, the roof of the helmet and going up, 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 up to the guy holding it and making sure that the oxygen is coming in from the boat on top. And if the guy was in danger, he would yank and he would pull him up, right? So too, every Jew is like a scuba diver. We're sent, bedavka, purposely, to the depths, to the depths, to the depths. What are, you, what are you doing there? You're there to collect pearls, holy sparks. That's why you're there. And then when it gets dangerous, you see the sharks coming. Oh my God, I'm finished. So you yank, help, help me Hashem. You yank and they pull you back up. That's Rav Nassim's analogy of why you're sent in dark situations. And the key for all this is speech. It's the speech, the dibor, which is the key to do the yanking, to get back up and to pull out all these sparks is the speech. But the only way they get out speech from you is that when you're squeezed enough and the speech is sincere. You're davening 50, 150 times davening, Hashem help me, Hashem help me, it's dead. And then that 151 time comes along, where your mamash being squeezed, and you love it from your kishka, oh my God, Hashem, help me. Help me, Hashem, please help me. Anna Hashem, Moshe, Anna, and you cry from your depths. That one davening pulls you up. You're waiting 150 days, 150 davenings to get to number 151, because they're waiting to squeeze you enough. You're not yet squeezed, because the, the, the dibur is not sincere enough. The only way to get a sincere dibur out of a person 
is if he's squeezed enough. They know how to control the squeezing from heaven to make it the, the right type of control, a level of Dibur comes out. When finally he's squeezed enough, then he's pulled out and he can come back out of his But everything is basically the idea of speech, of Dibur. Okay, so now to continue. Aval, this is now what we said now about the sparks coming up with, with Sarah, was because she was Sarah, okay? But now he says there's something with Hora which is difficult. Aval imu dibur pashut, but now if it's not a dibur like Sarah, he said, remember? Hinekisha dibur, dibur hakadosh, he started off earlier. If the dibur is a speech of holiness, like the idea of Sarah, so then there's a mission to, to, to extract all these sparks. But if now the speech which gets trapped, in other words, the person's level of speech is pashut, and when he blemishes a simple dibur, dibur God forbid, and he gets trapped, by Mitzrayim, that was the analogy he mentioned before. Efsha sheit pesu oto lesham, vechimat chas veshalom, ishtaka sham, im lo sheavo tzadik emet, sheesh lo koach lo tzio misham. To explain, right? If now it's a simple speech, chas veshalom, God forbid, so it's possible that they will trap the speech there in the, side, in the area of the, of the domain of impurity, and it's possible kimat borderline, God forbid, that this Dibur, this person who's Dibur, which we see is connected to the person's nefesh, coming up, he's going to say that also, will stay there, Yishtakasham, unless, Im lo tzadik emet, unless a true tzadik comes along, sheyesh to korach misham, who has the power, the ability to extract him from there. This requires explanation, because he mentioned an idea beforehand, which makes it sound like Dibur kadosh is to collect all these sparks. Dibur Pashut is, there's no hope. Only a Tzadik Ha'emet will come to pull out the person. So, to explain. Each person, you have you in relationship, in the same English, vis-a-vis the Tzadik. And you have also within yourself what's called the point of the Tzadik. Okay? You have who you are, but who your real essence is. It's called in Yiddish, the Pintel Yid. Rav Nosin says, the Pintel Yid, the essence of Yiddish in every Jew, is, has the same power as the concept of the tzaddik. That is the true tzaddik hidden within a person. And only when that a person gets trapped, he has to wait for the tzaddik emet, Rav Nosan explains this on Nukut Alachot, that the person's inner pintaliyid wakes up and does the smashing to break the evil and to come out. But the average person doesn't get that far. The average Jew, he doesn't have normally the ability to activate the true tzaddik to come out. He has only a dibu pashut, and he's stuck with the dibu pashut, meaning it's not full heartedly. He can't, he can't reach that far. But he says here, dibu pashut, right? The simple speech on its own is trapped. You need the tzaddik I met who has what's called dibu kadosh, the idea of Sarah, to pull him out. Okay? We had a, this is a question based on what we said at the beginning of the class. The question is, you, Rabbi Nachman says you need to make the first move. A person has a deep pashut, if he doesn't make the first move, how is the tzaddik going to pull him out? It's a question. It's a steer out of him. It's a, this is the concept known. The Rabbeinu said that the tzaddik can't do everything. You have to make the initiative. But here he's saying, saying something which is opposite. It's now deep pashut, a simple speech, is stuck there. Kima yishtaka, if not a tzaddik emet will come along and to pull him out. This is a question, a question on the side. We'll see if we can answer it as the time, as the lesson will unfold. But this is the question in Torah. What does this person have as chut? If he has a dibu pashut and he's going to be stuck there, what initiative did he do in order for the tzaddik I met, the true tzaddik, to come along and to activate his release from where he's trapped right now? What did he do? If he's a dibu pashut and he's not making initiative to show Hashem, help me, because it's a dibu pashut. He doesn't have the ability to cry out to Hashem. That's what Dibur Pashut means. It's not a holy Dibur. Holy Dibur is a, is, is a Dibur of prayer. But Dibur Pashut means a simple mundane speech that the person's trapped in. What merit does he have that the true tzaddik should come to, to bring him out? What did he do? What initiative did he do that the tzaddik Ahmed should come along to get him? So this is a question. Keep it on the side. Okay? So now, this, this, will, until, this ends the first part of this lesson. Now starts the second part of this lesson. This second part of the lesson was not written properly. You'll see at the very end of the lesson that Rav Nosen writes, when I showed all this I heard from Rabbeinu, 
כשראה דברים אלה אצלי בכתב, afterwards when Rabbeinu saw what I wrote, and this lesson is not לשם רבינו, this is a lesson where Rav Nosen heard Rabbi Nachman giving over this, this lesson, he wrote it in his own words, and then he would show it to Rabbi Nachman for approval. So here, Rabbeinu, Rabbi Nachman still told Rabbi Nosen, כשראה דברים אלה אצלי בכתב, אמר שדברים אלה לא כתבתי מיפה כראוי. You didn't write this at all, you didn't write this at all properly. You didn't write it properly as, it, as, as, it, as it's fit. And it's a big question mark here, because normally, normally everything that Rav Nosen wrote, he would show it afterwards to Rabbi Nachman for approval. And here he says, you didn't write anything at all correctly. So fix it. Normally, when Rav Nosen would write something, so he'd show it to Rabbeinu for approval. What does it mean for approval? That Rabbi Nachman would correct, say, instead of this word, use this word. Instead of this, say like this. So Rav Nosen wrote it, and he would show it to Rabbeinu, and Rabbeinu would make some corrections. Here, Rabbi Nachman didn't make corrections. He left it like this, and it's part of the Kutei Moran even. If you're showing it to Rabbeinu, Rabbeinu says already, you didn't write properly, so correct him, so correct Rav Nosen. Why, why do you leave it uncorrected and you put it in the Likutei Moran like this? What's going on? It's a big question here. It's a big question here. And Rav Nosen says, Rabbeinu said, you didn't write it properly. So Rabbeinu, if you, told, if you already told Rav Nosen you write it properly, why leave it like that? Change it, fix it. This is not one of those lessons. Oh. There's two types of lessons in the Kutemur. There's Lashon Rabbeinu, which is word for word Rabbi Nachman. Or he gave Rav Nosen over to copy his manuscript, or he dictated word for word. This is not one of those lessons. It didn't say at the beginning of Shem Rabbeinu. Lesson 62 was, if you look at lesson Son of Bed, that we were doing for these past two months, whatever, so there is the Shem Rabbeinu. But this little Torah called Samech Gimel, which by the way is connected to Torah 62, is not the Shem Rabbeinu. It's Rav Nosen, what he heard, and he wrote it in his own words. But this Seifa now, just to, to, to keep your eyes open, I asked the question, leave the question on the side. It's a question, why is it part of the Kutim Moran? If Rabbeinu says you didn't write in Kara'u, he still fixed him, so correct him. Yet, he purposely left it like this, mumbled, and we're going to see how it's mumbled. Look how mumbled it is. Watch the wording. The flow, normally Rav Nosen, when he writes, he writes clear. He's very clear, Rav Nosen. Whatever you see in the Kutim Moran, a difficult part, immediately Rav Nosen detects that it's difficult on the Pshat, and you'll see there's like a square bracket, and Rav Nosen is explaining that part of the Kutim Moran. Rav Nosen made it that all the Kutim Moran, most of it, all of it, nine, except, this is an example where it's not, is super duper clear, that it's made to be clear, okay? But here you see the flow of Nussan's wording is not clear. Let's watch, let's see. So it's, it's a new topic basically, but it's connected to the idea of speech, which we just mentioned. Ve'yesh Adam, and there is a person, there's another point, moreover, like another point. There is a man, she'na'aseh mikulo u'mimenu dibur, that the person becomes talk, everyone begins to talk about the person. It's made from him, him entirely, and from himself, speech. People begin talking about him. And it's understood that they begin to speak about him in a negative way. That everyone's talking about him. Politics, whatever. Everybody's talking about this person. And this person, because now he, he becomes a part of the speech of other people, so it's damaging. And it's damaging. And the person now, because now he's being spoken about by many people, he's going like Navana, like a, a wanderer, uh, who's restless, who doesn't have rest. And he's spreading in the mouths of everybody. He doesn't have menucha, he doesn't have rest. And by each person that he, the person, comes to in their mouth, that they're talking about him, he has all types of sufferings, and difficulties. Because each person, according to their level, each person has an aspect of paro. In other words, a negative trait that is an aspect of paro. So now, if if now this person comes to the mouth of a big person, a big chashu, important person, that this big person starts talking negatively about this other person, so by the big person who's a big shot, Sham Paro Melech, there Paro is king, Umitzrayim Medina, and Mitzrayim is the nation, and Ushlo Shasarim, the three ministers. In other words, there's room to be trapped, that the speech will be trapped there. So now, there's two versions of this lesson. What we have printed 
is one version, and there's also what's called the uh, nusach and the ketav yad, which makes more sense. Because in the, in the grammar of this verse, of this section here, you have to put here a period at this point. There's no period by you guys. Sham paro melech mitzvah medina shashah sarim nekuda, period. Put a period here. And then it should continue. Ve'af keshehem tofsim. And even when they grab Hadibur, the speech, this big guy who's Paro, Mitzrayim, and the three ministers, a big guy, and he begins to speak blemish speech, bad words about this other person. So now when they grab the speech, see, it's very hard to understand these ideas. Venofer alehem, and the person, because they're speaking about him, it's as if he spiritually falls into their hands. When some guy, a big shot who's a wicked guy, I guess, who has by him Paro, Mitzrayim, and ministers, and he, such a person, talks bad about this other guy. So other guy, because they're speaking about him, so to speak, he becomes trapped. His nefesh, when you see coming up, is going to interchange between the word dibur and nefesh. The soul, which is connected to the dibur, the fact that the speak, people are speaking bad against him, gives him to be submitted. He has now, he's now in a situation where he's submitted to these people who are speaking about him. And he falls into their hands. Look at that. He's now under their in a way, and he's under their control in a way. It's very difficult for him. Even though this is the case, nevertheless, yeshlo naicha. There's some, there's some, what's it called? There's some nacha, there's some pleasure that will come out of this. That it's possible that he will find there. Holy Sparks, because it's a big person who's speaking against him. It's someone who's Adam Gadol, he said. Who by there, there's Melech Paro and there's Mitzrayim. That means that there's Holy Sparks to collect here. So there is a Naicha when a person, or when, a, when a, another Yid is, is being t- spoken about negatively, and it's, it's big people who are speaking about him, not regular people. Big people who are Chashuv, they're the ones speaking against him. So because they're big people, so there's a possibility of now that he. Because they're speaking bad about him, it's as if his nefesh, the person who's being spoken about, is now trapped by these people. And because it's a big shot, there there's Paro, there there's Mitzrayim, there there's the, the Shalosh Sarim, the three ministers. So that means there's holy sparks here. So there he said, now it's possible that he, he can find there holy sparks. Then there will come something good out of it. That when he comes out, he'll elevate these holy sparks, this goodness. But then he goes on, Ach, Kesheba. But however, if he comes to the mouth of low lives, low people who speak against him, who speak about him, and there, when they now take the dibur that they're speaking badly about him, and so to speak, they trap his nefesh with the dibur about him in the orif, which is the nape, by the letters of Paro. Again, these concepts you see, they're difficult to fit in. It, it's not, the wording is hard, but there's an idea that's going to come out that we can get at least. That's what we're going to come up in the summary. So. And the person now, his nefesh, because they're speaking about him, he falls to their domain. And these are low people. These are people who are not of a high level. They're not big shots. Vesham, so there, because they're not big people, it's a desert, wasteland. Midbar Shrama, Sia Arava. It's a total wasteland. Lo Avar Ba'ish, Ein Lo Emish Lifgoa. The person now, the nefesh, the dibur who's there, who's trapped, has no holy sparks to come in contact with in order to elevate. Because it's an empty person. Tsar umar me'od. This is very difficult for the soul. Ha nefesh We're going to explain to this in questions about this paragraph. Just let's finish the paragraph. Ha nefesh holechet na'a benada. Then the soul is torn apart. Holechet na'a benada. It's traveling like a wanderer again without any rest. Umit pazeret befizur ha nefesh. And it's spread out, like a soul being spread out. There's no yeshuvada, there's no con- tranquility, there's no concentration, there's no peace of mind. And it's being spread out in the mouths of several people, who are again low people. He's tired, he's drained, he's hungry, he's thirsty in a desert. There's nothing there for him to collect. There's no holy sparks to connect to in order to come out with. She has, the soul has no nourishment to restore her soul. The speech, the nefesh is interconnecting. Inter- he once, once says, Dibur now goes to nefesh. Right? 
she begins to eat herself. There's no, there's no nourishment, so the soul, the dibur, begins to eat itself up. It's an expression. Bivchinat ish besar zro yochelu. It's a verse in Isaiah. Every man eats his own arm. The flesh of his arm he eats. In other words, he begins to consume himself in order to survive. It's difficult because why is it difficult? Because there, there's an idea that every area of creation has to have a drop of kedusha. There has to be some sparks of holiness. It does not exist that even though there's a midbar, there's something which is a desert, that there's no spark of holiness there. Because how does it exist? It can only exist. Anything can exist in the world, even a scenario, a situation of sin. Rabbi Lu talks about this in Lesson 56. It can only exist if there's a holy spark nourishing it. And here he's saying that now it's impossible. The soul comes down and there's no sparks to elevate it. To answer this, we can go back to what he said earlier, that unless a big tzaddi comes along and pulls him out. A, rag, a regular Joe Shmo, a regular guy who gets trapped by low people, in the speech of low people, him, for sure, it's a desert. According to his level, there's no Kedusha that he can get into because he's very limited. However, if a big tzaddik purposely comes to this domain, in other words, the mouth of low people, so there, he, the holy tzaddik is able to connect to the spark giving life source hidden in the desert, in the low people, and yes, there, to connect the holy sparks and elevate it. So this is, in a way, an explanation of what he said earlier. Or this, this is answered by what he said earlier, that the tzaddik emet can pull out a person because he risks being trapped there forever because there's no holy sparks to connect to in order to give him the energy to come up, to explain. A person now who's thrown in a yerida, like the guy, the guy in, the, in the sea who's looking for the pearls. The excitement a diver, a scuba diver has when he finds the pearls, that excitement gives him the energy to come back up now. He has the simcha, the joy that he found the treasure, he found pearls, so it's easier for him to get back out because he has, he has a nachat, there is a, a consolation, I found something here. As opposed to someone who doesn't find anything, so it, he's, he's drained, he's tired, he's wasted, he can't get out. So what's the analogy, the nimshal, is that when a person goes to low places and he's sent there in order to find holy sparks, when he connects to these holy sparks, they give him energy. They fuel him, because that's what the sparks are, they're energy. The Kedusha, holy, holy energy, it connects to him, and that gives him the energy to come back out. So here now, the average guy who's in the mouth of average people, he can't find holy sparks, so there's no energy to give him that koch to come out. Unless a big tzaddik, someone bigger than him, comes to that level where he is, and this tzaddik's able with his x-ray eyes, if you want to call it, to tap in, in this desert of these low people, to find the holy spark giving them their life force, to connect in a deeper level, dig deeper, and to yes, connect to the holy sparks there, and yes, uh, reveal it, and pull out the holy sparks, plus the guy who's trapped there together, we said earlier. So this is the idea, Anashim Shvelim, Anashim Gdolim, but when he says in the opening, that means Vyesh Adam, there is a person that is made from him entirely speech, so it's understood that he's talking about a regular person, not a tzaddik, because because how can he reach a scenario that he comes to the mouth of regular people and he's trapped, he can't get out. That means he himself is mundane also. He's not holding at a high level that he can get out. He needs a bigger tzaddik to get him out here. Fine. So, but now he goes on about the difficulties of the situation. For example, he gives another analogy. Someone about the idea that when a person now, the, the case of the, the scenario of the guy who's come to the mouth of low people and there's no Kedusha there at all and begins to eat himself up. So he goes on, <laughs> he goes on to mention the negative of the situation. Already that this part in the Kuti Imran gives a negative picture and that Rabbeinu said to Rav Nossin, you didn't write correctly here, we can see that this is the point that's missing. The Yitchazkut in this paragraph is what's missing because it's a very negative paragraph and we have to read it. It's part of the Kutim Moran. And we'll get over it and show that, that with what we said before, that the Tzadikim have the ability, yes, to always help a person. So now he goes on to the situation of the guy who's trapped all alone. And like an analogy, a, a mashal, of a person who's freezing. And he has no blanket, no jacket to warm himself up. And to cover himself up. So what does he do? 
He covers himself up with his arms. Mechapel, he mechabek, he mechabets atzmo. He hugs and tightens himself like this to keep himself warm. He uses his own body to warm himself, and it's not enough. Kmo chen ha nefesh, so too the soul. Ain la kshum kisui litatev ulechasot atzma. She has nothing to cover itself, to wrap itself with. Vibechinat, what it says in chapter 107 to Hillim, which is the key psalm to this Torah, which we're going to see coming up. Nafsham bahem titatav. Their souls wrapped in themselves. Bahem titatav, right? Of the four, we have to give thanks to Hashem. This is one scenario. Their souls were wrapped up into them. Okay? This is the case. Which case is this? We have a book of Tehillim here. I just want to see which of the four is this. Is this the one who's in the desert? One second. I think it's the one who's in the desert. Chapter 107. We can tell them 107. Yeah. The first one. Re'evim gam tzemeim nafsham bahim titataf. The ones who are in the desert. Ta'u ben midbar rabbi shimon darech. They were in the desert and they're hungry, they're starving and they're thirsty. And nafsham bahem titatav. Wow. They wrap themselves in in their in, in the, they're, they're, they're wrapping their souls in themselves. They're covering themselves with their with their with their atifa. The guy in the desert. He has to wrap himself in order to keep himself warm. Shemit atefet me'atzma mine uve. It wraps itself up, up in itself, using itself. So much so, the soul is about to faint. Even if they give it to eat, she's so weak, she can't even receive the food. Like La the Holocaust. At the end, when they tried to come, the British and the, the American soldiers, whatever, and they started giving food to the, the, the Jews who were starving to eat, they couldn't even put the food in their mouth. They were so weak, they were so drained. Even to put the food in their mouth, they couldn't do. They couldn't receive the food. And those who ate, they died. There was, there was, Terrible cases that more Jews died on the Liberation Day than, than in total when the day by day. The Jews who died while just eating and not and not eating properly, they just ate the food, they gobbled it down, their bodies couldn't hold the food, they died, their stomachs blew up, they couldn't handle the food. So it's someone who's so sick, he reaches the point, you're like a sick person who's for a long time sick, lying sick, to the point where he's about to faint. You can't even give him any food, he can't receive. He has no ability to receive food, which is for his own benefit, his own nourishment. He can't receive it, he's so weakened. He pushes it away and he cannot receive it. So he goes on, what can we do? It's like as if we're stuck. We caused for ourselves this damage. That we did not listen to the good advice that Hashem gave to us. Kifan will lie orf, because like Hashem says, as the verse says, they turned to me their necks. In other words, paro, they activated the back. Velofanim, ve'azhu chavush, and then a person is trapped in a jail. Kinitpas v'nes arsha. All right? So we'll stop here now because the time is up. But this is very negative. This is not the way, huh? Not five minutes, okay. Seven. This is not the way the Rav Nassim talks. And this is not the way Rabbi Nachman talks. To leave on a negative note. So that's why Rabbi Nachman said afterwards, you didn't write this correctly. This is not written properly. Because always the way of rest of teachings is to, to end on a positive note of hope. And here it's scary because he makes it sound like <laughs> it's finished and he's stuck and what can we do? Our sins cause this. It's not the way. It's, oh no, the, the coming up the peace will continue like that. You'll see it's going to continue. We'll, we'll do it next week. We'll, we'll finish the lesson next week. Bezat Hashem. Because the ideas are just unbelievable, Bezat Hashem. But you see here already the message. When you read this, you get a very negative picture. And like a person's trapped and he's dying and eating and he's covering himself up and he can't do anything about it. And that's not the way of how Rav Nossin writes and how Rabbi Nachman writes also. There's always a Nekudah hope and he gives the Eitzah. So here again, it looks, it seems that the piece missing here is what was mentioned earlier that yet there is a big tzaddik who can come and get a person out. And with this we'll end the message is that this is the concept of attaching yourself to a tzaddik. You need a tzaddik. Why do you need a tzaddik? Because you can have situations in life that mamash, according to your level, you're stuck. Yes, they throw you in a situation where there's no free will in this situation. Yes, you're mamash stuck. You need a higher level of kedusha to be activated to get you out. This is the idea of Yitkarvut Why does Hashem do that? Where's free will? Test me, it's me, it's my test. 
why you make it Hashem that you put me in a situation that only a level above my level can get me out of the situation. So this again, we go back to the Chaim Moran. We mentioned many times that what Rabbeinu says in Chaim Moran, that before Hashem gives the green light for an outstanding tzaddik to come down to this world, it's possible to be mistad there and to serve Hashem with the traditional chain of Judaism, of Torah, of tefillah, of mitzvah performance, and that's enough to keep you alive and to keep you connected to Hashem and to get you out of all your difficult situations. However, he continues Rabbeinu, once Hashem allows outstanding lights, outstanding tzaddikim to come down to this world, he gives the green light for these tzaddikim to come down. This is Rabbi Nachman's wording. It becomes impossible to serve Hashem, to survive without the assistance, without coming close to these tzaddikim. So it's explained, Avram ben Nachman, the author of the Biyot Kutim, the deep commentary of the Kutim Ran, he explains in the beginning of his book, the Kutim Ran, he explains like this, is that for the sake of free will, if Hashem sends down such tzaddikim to the world, so along with this light of tzaddikim for the Bechira Chofshit, comes down such a level of tuma into the world that it becomes impossible to be saved from these waves of atheism and darkness and choshech unless you do turn to the beacon of light in the generation. So in other words, the test of free will is a national level. And you're caught up because of the national level situation. Because Hashem sent down a big tzaddik and now there's a darkness in the world and your tests are from this darkness, which is above your level. It's at the level of the tzaddik. What's your free will? Whether you choose whether or not to attach yourself to this tzaddik. You hear that? It's not our personal free will choice. Was my bechayach of sheet? It's not you anymore in the picture because Hashem sent down purposely to the world a higher level of existence, a higher level of kedusha to the world, and countering it is also a higher level of darkness. And you, Mr. Joshua, in your situation, you won't be able to be to survive your situation. It'll be impossible. Yes, tests that are above a person's level. Yes, kipshuto. Why? Because it's up to you now to choose whether or not to look for these tzaddikim, to connect to them, which means to believe in them, number one, and to believe in their Torah teachings. To have emuna, emuna chachamim, emuna tzaddikim. This emuna is enough to give a person the koach, supernatural, superhuman levels of kedusha above the person's level to counter these type of tests. This is the idea of countering all the situations. This, by the way, is the deeper explanation of what the Arizal says, the light of Mordechai is revealed at Kriyata Megillah. And the Kabbalah explains that on Purim, this light which comes down once a year, it's called the Or of Mordechai. Ha'arat Mordechai comes down once a year, is to give people this boost of a light of Kedusha above their level and to free them. That's why Purim, the, the Arizal explains, from Purim to Pesach, uh, every day, there's 30 days, 1.30th every day, you're coming out of your personal Mitzvah. Until Pesach comes, you have this big light. That's the explanation of the big light people have on the night of the Seder. Every Jew in the world, even Friday, and Jews are not affiliated, on the night of Pesach they have some high feeling. That comes from Purim. That from Purim, every day, 1.30th, 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 until you come to the 30th day, which is Pesach, you feel this Cherut. It comes from, it starts from the light of Mordechai, activated on Purim, which in our terms, we're talking in Hasidic terms, terminology is the light of the Tzadik, which we to tap into it, to use it, and uh, to come out of our situations, and to come closer to Hashem.